The Revolution of Everyday Life by Raoul Vanagem. This is like um, an epilogue. It's called A Toast to Revolutionary Workers. Radical criticism has merely analyzed the old world and its negation. It must now either realize itself in the practical activity of the revolutionary masses or betray itself by becoming a barrier to that activity. So long as the project of the whole human being remains the specter haunting the void of unmediated self-realization, so long as the proletariat does not achieve a de facto reappropriation of theory from those who have distilled it from the proletariat's own movement, so long will each radical step forward be followed by ideologies two steps back. By urging proletarians to lay hold of a theory derived from direct daily experience and from the lack of it, my Traité de Savoir Vivre cast its lot unequivocally with the cause of transcendence. But by the same token, it laid itself open to all the falsifications that are bound to accompany any and all delay in putting these lessons into insurrectional practice. The moment radical theory becomes independent of the self-movement of revolutionary consciousness, as when this consciousness is suddenly inhibited by history, it becomes other than itself while remaining itself, and cannot completely evade capture by a parallel but contrary movement. By regression, towards separated thought, towards the spectacle, even when a book like this one contrives to embody its own self-criticism, this merely exposes it to ideological parasites. These run the gamut in this instance from subjectivism to nihilism, via communitarianism and apolitical hedonism, to say nothing of our old friends, the puffed-up bullfrogs of critical criticism. Before too long, radical working-class action will subordinate the spheres of production and consumption to the needs and passions of individuals. Working-class action is, initially at least, the only force capable of subverting these spheres. The historical procrastinations of this movement show, however, that the portion of the proletariat which has no direct control over economic processes has been capable at best, in its ascendant phase, of framing and disseminating a theory which it could not itself actualize or adjust. In a period of defeat, moreover, it has turned this theory into a regression of the intellect. A consciousness which never attained a true purchase on its own time has developed into a strictly retrospective parading of banners. The subjective expression of the Situationist project reached its highest point when it prepared the ground for May 1968 and accelerated the growth of, subcon of consciousness of the new forms of exploitation. Its lowest ebb has been an intellectualized reading born of the inability of a large number of people to destroy what can only be destroyed through sabotage and subversion, not occupations, by the workers responsible for the economy's key sectors. The Situationist project nevertheless represented the most advanced practical thought of a proletarian sector with no access to the levers of the commodity process. What is more, in its formulation, this project never for a moment relinquished as its appointed and indivisible task the annihilation of the social organization of survival in favor of generalized workers' control. It is therefore bound to rediscover its real internal movement in a working class context and there resurface, leaving the spectacle's hot air specialists picking over the carcass of its former incarnation to see what use they can make of these remains. Radical theory belongs to whoever causes it to progress. To defend it against books or other cultural merchandise wherein it reposes too often and too long on display is not to set an anti-work, anti-self-sacrifice, anti-hierarchy worker against a proletarian restricted to an unarmed consciousness of the same refusals. Rather, it is to call upon those who find themselves at the most basic level of the unitary struggle against the society of survival to use the forms of expression most effectively available to them and to perform revolutionary deeds which forge their own language by creating conditions from which there is no possible turning back. Sabotage of the forced labor system, destruction of the processes of commodity production and reproduction, expropriation of stores and plant in the name of the revolutionary forces and of all those allied with them by reason of passionate attraction, 
Here are means capable of putting an end not only to the bureaucratic reserve army constituted by intellectualizing workers and workerist intellectuals alike, but also to the intellectual manual dichotomy itself, and indeed eventually to the whole world of separations. Down with the division of labor and the universal factory. Long live the unity of non-work and generalized workers' control. The main theses of the Traité de Savoir Vivre must now find corroboration of a concrete sort in the actions of its anti-readers, not in the shape of student agitation, but in the shape of total revolution. The task of theory henceforth is to carry violence where violence already holds sway. Workers of Asturias, Limburg, Poznan, Lyons, Detroit, Seppel, a Leningrad, Canton, Bu Buenos Aires, Johannesburg, Liverpool, Karuna, Coimbra. It is you who are destined to let the entire proletariat add the joy of revolution made for one and for all to the lesser everyday pleasures of love, iconoclasm, and obedience to the dictates of passion. Without the criticism of arms, the arms of criticism are but weapons of suicide. Many proletarians successfully avoid the despair of terrorism and the poverty of militantism, only to become voyeurs of the working class, spectators of their own shelved potential. Cuckolded and defeated as revolutionaries saw revolution. They settle for the role of revolutionary by proxy, awaiting the moment when the falling rate of petty bureaucratic power hands them a chance to offer themselves as mediators and play the leader under the banner of their very inability to smash the spectacle. They are the reason why the organization of insurgent workers, the only revolutionary organization needed henceforth, must be the work of the insurgent workers themselves. Otherwise, the proletariat as a whole will have no organizational model in its fight for generalized workers' control. The advent of this type of organization will mark the final passing of repressive organizations states, parties, unions, hierarchical groups of all kinds, along with their critical corollary, that fetishism of organization which flourishes in the ranks of the non-productive proletariat. The immediate practice of such an organization will eradicate the contradiction between voluntarism and realism, which mark the limits of the situationist international, confronted by the perpetual reemergence within itself of the relationships characteristic of the dominant world outside, that group found that its own means of dealing with this situation, exclusion and rupture, were in a deed, and a way was never found to harmonize intersubjective agreements and differences. It will become clear eventually that the portion of the proletariat with no concrete possibility of, subver of subverting the means of production is in need not of organizations, but rather of individuals acting for themselves. Such individuals may federate from time to time into commando groups for the purposes of sabotage, attacks on the apparatus of repression, occupation of radio stations, etc. They will intervene wherever and whenever the prospect of tactical and strategic effectiveness is offered. Their sole concern will be to pursue undivided gratification and, inseparably, to kindle the fire of working-class guerrilla warfare, that negative and positive fire which, though it begins in the very heart of the proletariat, is nevertheless the only possible basis for that class's abolition as part of the abolition of class society in its entirety. The workers may still lack the coherence of their own potential strength, but one thing is certain. Once they do achieve that coherence, their victory will be definitive. The recent history of wildcat actions and, art and riots is the writing on the wall which announces the resurgence of workers' councils and the return of communes. The sudden reappearance of these forms sure to be met by a repressive counterattack whose violence will put the repression of intellectual movements in the shade, is likely to surprise only those who cannot discern, beneath the pluralisms of the spectacle's immobility, the unitary progress of the old mole. The proletariat's continuing clandestine struggle for the appropriation of history and the global overthrow of all the conditions of daily life. In the meantime, the necessity of history for itself may be perceived in all its cunning in the negative coherence attained by a proletariat disarmed, a sort of concave unanimity, which stands as a monument warning to everything which threatens the radicalism of the working class from within, 
to intellectualizing tendencies which cause consciousness to regress to the level of book learning and culture, to uncontrolled mediators and their bureaucratic opposition, to the status lovers, more enamored of the renewal of roles than of their dissolution in the playful emulation characteristic of the basic guerrilla group, and to all those forces which press for the abandonment of concrete subversion of the revolutionary conquest of territory of the unitary international march towards the end of separations, the end of self-sacrifice, the end of forced labor, the end of hierarchy, and the end of the commodity in its every last manifestation. The gauntlet thrown down by reification to each person's creativity can no longer be picked up by means of some theoretical, what is to be done. The proper response lies rather in the practice of the revolutionary act, Anyone who fails to discover in revolution the crucial passion which opens the door to all others can attain but a travesty of real pleasure. The Traité de Savoir Vivre sought to trace the shortest path from individual subjectivity to its actualization in history made by all. From the standpoint of the long revolution, it was a mere point of departure on the road towards communalism and generalized self-management. Similarly, the Traité is merely an outline albeit an outline of the death sentence which, which the Society of Survival pronounces upon itself and which will one day be executed without appeal by the international of factories, fields, and streets. We have a world of pleasures to win and nothing to lose but boredom.